<laughs> well, we wanted something that you wouldn't forget, and I don't think you'll forget that. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I want to tell you about someone named Danielle News, and this is Danielle right here, right? Right here. Oh, oh right here, okay. Danielle's right here on the guest at your table flyer. And you can go online too and look at, look at more pictures and, and read more about these stories that I'm gonna talk about this morning. But back when the earthquake hit Haiti, 2010, Danielle News watched the devastation all around her. Houses were destroyed, ways to make a living literally just evaporated overnight. And access to food and water became more and more limited. And Danielle watched and thought. Now she'd grown up watching her mother work as a community organizer and her grandfather work as a farmer. And so Danielle came up with a plan. A plan that would have surprised many who wouldn't have imagined that this young woman, who was experiencing the same challenges as everyone else, this young woman had a creative vision that offered to join people together to give of themselves and change a bad situation. And Danielle Noose also offers an opportunity for us. But I'm gonna keep that a secret for a bit because I like suspense and keeping you in it. And, uh, and like all important journeys, we have to first experience a few other things before we get to that final destination, but we'll get there. So I wanna start with a secret. And this one has to do with my spouse who just happens to be here this morning and didn't know I was going to do this. <laughs> now, one of the things he didn't know when he was agreeing to when I got into ministry is that none of our secrets are really safe anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, I figure it's okay because we're just gonna keep this between all of us, right? <laughs> so the truth is that my spouse is secretly terrified, and I mean terrified, of sock monkeys. <laughs> now, do you all know what those are? I, if you don't, I think, Katie, you probably have a picture for us. Um, there we go. <laughs> you know, that's kind of creepy now that I look at it. With <laughs> new eyes there. We better, we better move on to something else. We don't want to traumatize Lawrence. I'm sorry. <laughs> but listen, if, if I'm going to reveal that, then I have, to, I have to admit that I, too, have a secret terror. My fear is Santa Claus. In fact, I was originally going to call the sermon Attack of the Giant Santa Claus. But first, I want to tell you about my family, because they, too, have a secret, all kinds of secrets this morning. Now, in our family, we suffer from an ailment. It's an illness that comes this time every year and is characterized by a variety of symptoms. Irritability, fatigue, lethargy, all kinds of mysterious aches and pains. We call it holiday itis. Now, we first recognized holiday itis a while back because each December, when the family gathers to celebrate the holidays, we noticed that someone is always sick. <laughs> it's gotten to be so consistent that we call each other up and say, Well, who's it going to be this year? Who's going to have holiday itis? Our first explanation was, you know, it's cold and flu season. But then we started to notice a pattern. The symptoms begin right around now, just before Thanksgiving, and they get worse and worse until they reach their peak for us right around Christmas Day, which our family celebrates together. And then by New Year's, those symptoms vanish. And that made us wonder, could holiday-itis be a psychosomatic illness? <laughs> After all, as much as our family looks forward to being together for the holidays, there is also, I'll admit it, a great deal of stress involved. Now, maybe you can relate. There's the stress of decorating the house with garlands or twinkling lights. There's the search for just the right gift in crowded stores, glittering with one thing more expensive than the other. The planning of meals to satisfy everyone from an adult vegan to a six-year-old who only eats dinosaur-shaped chicken pieces. <laughs> really. 
add the media pundits with their divisive talk of the war on Christmas. That started already. Interactions with family members who you simply don't get along with, even though you try. And the expectation that we're supposed to stay jolly and patient with each other, as this is supposed to be, as, as our choir sang for us this morning, the most wonderful time of the year. And everything seems to be set to re relentlessly cheerful music. It's enough to give anyone, anyone, a bad case of holiday items. But I, like so many others, think that there has to be another way to find meaning in this hectic season. And I know it's something I've been trying to do for as long as I can remember. Now, we're going to go way back. One of my childhood stories, four years old. Four years old, I remember seeing Santa Claus in a television commercial where he said, ho, 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 don't forget the real reason for the season. Now, since the commercial was for a used car lot, <laughs> and that clearly didn't have anything to do with the holidays, I decided that Santa Claus, Santa Claus must somehow embody the real meaning of the holiday season. Now, admittedly, uh, my la visit to his lab at the mall had been a bit awkward. Santa's breath hadn't been very nice. It didn't smell like peppermint, if you get my drift. <laughs> and he seemed to have no idea that I was the kind of boy who preferred a book to Hot Wheels, but hey, I pushed that aside. Santa seemed to be everywhere at this time of year, so he must be the real reason for the season. Now, back at that time, my father was working two jobs and taking night classes, and things in our family were pretty tight. In fact, that TV where I saw that Santa commercial was a color TV, but something had gone wrong with the TV a while back, and the TV picture had only been shown in solely in shades of green for as long as I could remember. <laughs> We couldn't afford to fix it, so I got used to watching that green TV. You know, when Dorothy opened that door to Oz during the annual airing of The Wizard of Oz, I didn't know what the big deal was. I mean, because Oz was just as green as Kansas had been. <laughs> anyway, at that time, one of my father's jobs was at a department store. And the owner of the store was a man named Mr. Ellis, and he'd immigrated from Eastern Europe. And he was always helping to make our family help our family make ends meet. Now, I think he'd been helped himself when he first arrived here. For instance, one of the things he would do, he would dress the mannequins in clothes that would fit us so that my dad could have them when it came time to change the displays. And a couple of nights before Christmas, Mr. Ellis gave my father a giant, and I mean giant, blow-up plastic Santa Claus that used to stand outside the store during the holidays, filled with air. Nine feet tall, this Santa's head was a good five feet in circumference, with two great staring eyes, each the size of saucers. I was already in bed when my hard-working father came home with that deflated Santa under his arm. He and my mother huffed and puffed until they had inflated him up to his full height. They had to kind of bend Santa's head forward away from the ceiling in order to fit him in the corner of our living room opposite the Christmas tree. <laughs> then they went happily off to bed. <laughs> so the next morning is Saturday. I wake up early so I can watch cartoons sitting in front of that green TV in the living room. And just before that set flickers on, I catch sight in the screen of something reflected in the room behind me. Something big and tall, something with two huge eyes staring down at me from under ominous black brows. Almost frozen, I force myself to turn my head, and there, just a few feet away, I see a very large black buckled shoe. Slowly looking up, I can hardly comprehend the bright red legs and rotund body above those giant shoes. But when I see that bearded face, and I'll never forget this, with staring saucer eyes gaping at me, the paralysis lifts with a high-pitched shriek that surely awakens the neighbors from their sugar plum dreams. I tear up the stairway and into my parents' room, flinging myself onto the safety of their bed. Now later, my mom told me that just moments before this, she had awakened and said to my dad, do you suppose Jason might be scared if he's 
I think it was at that point that my shriek reverberated through the house. <laughs> so listen, one thing I was sure of that year, Santa Claus, Santa Claus had nothing to do with the real meaning of the season. But you know, if holiday-itis is the inflammation resulting from the holidays, and inflammation is the body's attempt at self-preservation to begin the healing process, then a giant Santa, giant Santa had nothing to do with it. So what was healing about the season? I kept looking. And a few years later, things were different in our family. My father had graduated and gotten a good job. Now we had a TV with all the colors, not just green. So we were happy to share our good fortune that year by participating in a program at church where we were given the name and address of the Jones family, a mother and her two boys who couldn't afford to have much of a holiday that year. My parents, brother, and I headed to the store and made our way through the aisles, eagerly loading up the shopping cart. After wrapping the gifts, we filled up the trunk of the car and merrily headed off to deliver them. The drive across town was a long one. I watched through the car's frosty window as our familiar suburban world dissolved into urban decay. Neat houses were placed by boarded up ones. As we got further from home, we got quieter. Finally, we stopped before a weather-beaten house. The door was opened by Mrs. Jones, who greeted us with a soft voice but looked us squarely in the eye. She said we could put the gifts in the dining room. Now, I'd anticipated leaving the gifts under a holiday tree, but there was no tree in this house. In fact, I couldn't tell the dining room from the living room, for they were both empty, just bare walls and worn but clean floors. Mrs. Jones motioned toward the other bare room. We used to have a piano, she said apologetically, and we knew then that if there had been a piano, there had likely been other furniture. She added, it's been a bad year. I was working two jobs, but I got let go from the first one and then the other. She paused and looked us in the eye, but we're figuring things out. We thanked her for letting us help, and we meant it. Any misconceptions we had about helping an underprivileged family vanished as we stood face to face with her, saw her strength and courage, and realized that though she lived on the other side of town, the Jones family wasn't any different from us. Back in our car for the trip home, I thought about whether the Jones family would have something to eat with, along with their presence. And I thought about how I hadn't known how grateful I could be to be allowed the honor of helping somebody else. And amidst the joy and pain of those thoughts, I realized, yeah, this is what it's all about. Meaning could be found in someone being brave enough to reach out for help and someone else being there. It was about all of us recognize, uh, recognizing our common humanity and our struggles. For if my family had been dealt different cards, we might easily have been the one living in that rundown house. After all, it had been just a short time before when we needed help from Mr. Ellis. And my family had learned from that experience how meaningful it was to know that someone cared. When the Jones family awoke on Christmas morning, they would know that they mattered to somebody out there. And it reminded us that we matter too because we could do something to help. Now this wasn't charity. This was living out our interconnectedness. As Reverend Amy Morgenstern says, this kind of giving shows us that we are all connected, that the barriers we erect between us are fictions, and that we must all work together toward our mutual liberation. That's empowerment. I'll never forget how meaningful, how empowering it was for my family to connect with that family on the other side of town. And we're lucky as Unitarian Universalists because we have programs like the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee's Guest at Your Table, a program which enables us to connect with the faces and stories of people, not just on the other side of town, but on the other side of the globe. For I believe that connection-making through giving is the real meaning 
of the holiday season. Now I know now that when people talk about the reason for the season, they're often referring to the Jesus narrative. But despite the way Christmas permeates American culture, as inclusive Unitarian Universalists, we also recognize the other rich winter holidays, such as Bodhi Day, Hanukkah, Solstice, Hanshaganapati, Human Light, or Kwanzaa. All of these holidays call us to value our sacred connections with each other. They're about more than that, though. They call us to redemption. As Bill Schultz, who's the president of the UUSC, says, I do believe that people, people of all faith, of any faith, want to believe that human history has the possibility of redemption. By redemption, we're talking about deliverance and rescue. But deliverance and rescue from what? I think that redemption comes for us when we step out of our current I culture and embrace a we one, rescuing and delivering ourselves from selfishness and isolation, reconnecting with that spirit of love that elevates us into becoming our better selves. Now listen, this idea of the holiday season as a time of redemption, it's no revolutionary idea. Does anybody know, uh, anybody heard of the Urban Dictionary online? Do you know how the Urban Dictionary defines a CEO Christian? That is, it's a Christmas and Easter only Christian. <laughs> that same dictionary defines a holiday Catholic as Catholics that only go to church on holidays like Christmas and Easter, they take all the good seats and overcrowd the parking lot. <laughs> So for many people, this may be the only time of the year they experience religious community. Likewise, during the holidays, people give to charities or volunteer their time at food pantries, again, often for the only time all year. So even amongst the pervasive, crass commercialization of the season, people's actions show that they intuitively associate the power of interconnection and giving with the holidays. Yet even while people are drawn to making these important connections, holiday-itis can rear its ugly head as a response to all that pressure to have the perfect holiday. And all that holiday pageantry can distract us from facing the stuff that's bothering us deep down, all those human connections that aren't going or haven't gone right in our lives, or all those connections that we've lost through separation or death plus all those fractured connections to humanity out in the wider world. So the holidays, holidays even amongst friends and family, can be a lonely time. And for those who are already lonely and feeling disconnected, this season can be especially difficult, as if that, that giant Santa Claus were up in their faces demanding, you will have a happy holiday. <laughs> Amidst the glare of tinsel and the expectation of perfection that stores try and sell us this time of year, these broken connections can seem beyond repair, leaving us feeling stressed, overwhelmed, even empty. So what can we do? What can we do to fight holiday-itis? What it takes, what it takes to begin healing the human race starts with consciously acknowledging that the holiday season is a call for us, all of us, to connect and give. We begin by working to be present to our friends and families and this community right here, giving of our time and love to each other, not losing ourselves amidst that quest for the merriest holiday possible, and not expecting someone to be anyone other than who they are. In other words, if your brother or mother-in-law or whoever gets on your nerves the rest of the year, don't expect it to be any different on Christmas or Hanukkah. And if you're feeling lonely or overwhelmed by whatever challenge you might be facing at the moment, reach out, reach out and allow yourself to be comfort, comforted by another person. Do you know, as Unitarian Universalists, we are called to think even more broadly than that, to recognize that we are motivated by a profound underlying love to connect, not just with our immediate communities, but the entire world. 
we have to save some, some of that energy we spend blowing up that giant Santa Claus and use it for something else, to give to others of our time, presence, or money while recognizing our common humanity. There's great power to heal and affect change in those loving connections as seen with our own UUSC. Like my family who was working hard to get by in tough times, like Mrs. Jones who was working to hold her family together, those working with the UUSC aren't passive victims. They are tapping into their creativity to solve difficult problems and need, they need our support. Now remember Danielle News talked about here at the beginning of the sermon, standing there, standing there in the rubble of the earthquake in Haiti, Danielle saw beyond the destruction she combined her skills in community organizing and farming to bring 60 families together to make tire gardens where edible food can be grown to eat or sell. She's now working on opening a training center in that city that will allow this program to help even more families to be trained to learn to grow their own food. Danielle is just one. She's just one of the many people throughout the world the UUSC is in partnership with, and we, we barely touched on the work that they do with ensuring the human right to safe drinking water, defending civil liberties right here at home, and helping in disaster situations like the recent typhoon in the Philippines. When we support the UUSC, we do so knowing we are helping to build a better world, often in places most of us will never see but to which we are connected nonetheless. So by all means, by all means, celebrate the season. String up those colored lights, put up your holiday trees, light your candles, wrap your presents, and indulge in festive dinners. But don't forget, amidst all of that, don't forget it's also the time to give. And remember that we hold on to that feeling of celebration, for the giving that we do is done in joy. That spirit of giving with love is the cure for holiday itis. There is no doubt. So I'd like to leave you here at the beginning of this season with a friendly warning to beware of sock monkeys. This comes from Lawrence. Santa Claus and holiday itis. But whatever you do, whatever you do, don't beware of love. Go out into the world and spread it around. That's the joy of the holiday season. But here's one last secret. It's not exclusive to it. It's available all year long. May it be so.